Yellow Brick War, Chapter 21 None of us needed a second prompting. We raced downstairs to the palace's main entryway, where the big wooden doors were already splintering. Gert, Mommy, and Knox joined hands, power flickering around them as they prepared to face Glinda's army. I tightened my grip on my knife. With a huge crack, crackling noise, the doors burst open, sending chunks of wood flying through the air. Mombi flicked her fingers and the pieces froze in midair and then clattered harmlessly to the ground. The first girls were already clamoring through the hole in the doors, spears at the ready. Knox hurled a fireball of magic at the invaders, and one girl shrieked in agony as it struck her full in the torso. She fell to the ground, her armor smoking, but more girls were already climbing over her inert body. I ran forward, my knife raised. Up close, Glinda's soldiers were terrifying. They filed their gleaming white teeth to sharp points spared by their eerie permasmile grins. Their armor crawled with tiny pink bugs that jumped at their opponents, buzzing and stinging. I knocked a soldier's spear out of her hand with one blow and cut her throat in the reverse swing, kicking the bo her body out of the way as a girl came for me in her place. Are they clones? I screamed across the hall to Knox, who was battling two more of Glinda's soldiers. The girls didn't seem to even register my question, and Knox was too busy to answer it. What are you? I asked the girl I fought now. Why are you fighting for Glinda? She bared her sharp teeth and lunged away toward my throat. Fine, I said, and stabbed her through the heart. Behind you, Knox yelled, and I turned just in time to dodge another blow. Knox sliced his way toward me. Right as he reached me, another soldier raised her sword, readying herself to stab him through the back. I hurled him to the ground and deflected her blow. A second later, he leapt to his feet, kicking her legs out from under her with unearthly speed and grace. Knox and I were fighting back to back, the way we always had. I couldn't help it, it just felt right. On either side of us, Annabelle, Melindra, and the other members of the Order slashed and stabbed. Gert and Mombi darted around the room, casting spells as they saw an opening. More girls piled down the remnants of the palace doors, and soon the battle spilled out into the courtyard. Glinda and Glamora, in their jeweled form, hovered overhead, swooping and diving through the air like human comets as they hurled fireballs and sizzling, lightning-shaped bolts of pink magic at one another. Over there, Gert crawled. I dispatched my newest opponent with a hard punch and looked up. Pete and Ozma were huddled up against a rock, wide-eyed and clinging to each other, still in change. chains. Pink chains, I saw it with disgust. After all, if this is, if this is over, I'm ne never wearing pink again, I thought. Now's your chance, Amy, Gert shouted, clearing the way to the prisoners with a huge ball of fire. I raced through the gap in the melee of Ozma's side. Ozma, are you all right? The corn harvest will be ready soon, she said politely. She's fine. Pete gasped. His face was bruised and bloodied, as if someone had been beating him up already. I had a pretty good guess as who it might be, and I wasn't too sorry about it either. You have to get us out of here, he pleaded. So you can sell us out to Glinda again, I snarled. Worked out pretty well for you last time, huh? I was desperate, he cried. Polychrome was going to kill me, you know that. Well, she can't kill you, you know, because she's dead, I said. Pete's eyes widened. Behind you. Right. I was in the middle of a battle. I whipped around, knife at the ready, but Knox had already made a short work of the girl soldier who had been out about to run me through like a, a shish kebab. If it isn't the little prince, he said with disgust, breathing hard as, if he, as he stared at Pete. We can't just leave him here to die, I said reluctantly. We have to get them both out of here. Are you sure? Knox growled. His hands burned with magic fire as he pulled at Pete's chains. But as soon as he touched them, the flame dissipated into smoke and the pink metal glowed with white hot. Pete yelped in pain, but the chains didn't budge. Hurts, Pete gasped. Please stop. Knox's spell had no effect on Ozma's bindings either, although she watched him work with detached interest. You'll have tea in the West Garden, don't you think? She offered. Knox, is sh Knox shook his head. Glinda's magic is too powerful. We have to get them back into the palace and hide them until there we have more time to undo the spell. Pete grabbed the rock of the ground to off the ground and held it up, as if he were going to blunge in the next girl's shoulder to death. Let me help, I yelled. No, Knox yelled back. Amy, you can't use magic. 
I won't be using any magic at all if I'm dead, I retorted. He shook his head, but he knew I was right. And I had Dorothy's shoes. I sent a tendril of power, making, shake, snaking down to my feet, and felt an answering pulse from my shoes. Help me, I thought. Whatever you are, please just help me. My boots twinkled as if on response. Suddenly I was surrounded by a dazzling cloud of tiny fireflies winking and glittering like diamonds. Because they were made of diamonds, I realized. All around me the battlefield went silent, as though I'd stepped into a sparkling silver bubble. I could still see it dimly, as if I were looking through a screen, but another image was superimposed over the carnage. I was standing in an old farmhouse. Everything was worn and shabby, but scrupulously clean. Once, bright yellow curtains, patched neatly in a dozen places, were piled open to reveal windows that looked out on endless, undulating prairie. An old man and woman were sitting at a rough kitchen table that had been worn smooth by the years, and a rosy-cheeked girl, young girl was serving the pie as they looked at her with an obvious pride. Her face was sweet and pretty, her blue eyes sparkled, and her glossy auburn hair was pulled into two neat braids. "'I know my crust will never be as good as Aunt M's,' she was saying." But I tried so hard on the ones to, on this one to make it perfect. I'm sure it's delici delicious, Dorothy," said the woman. A shock ran through me. This was Dorothy, but this girl bore no resemblance to the tarted-up villain I'd been trying to kill for what felt like forever. This person was just a child. This was the Dorothy whose journal I'd found. Dorothy looked up straight at me and starred, stared right through me. She couldn't see me. But then her eyes narrowed, and her face began to change. Her blue gaze looked at a tint of menace that was so familiar, and her smiling mouth twisted into sneer. Amy Gum, she said, and then her gaze dropped to my feet, and her eyes widened. My shoes, she whispered. Where did you find them? Her voice was tinged with wonder, and for a second she was the sweet little girl again. Dorothy, who are you talking to? Dor Aunt M asked, and Dorothy's expression wavered. But then she flicked her fingers dismissively, and Aunt M, Uncle Henry, and the farmhouse disappeared. We were standing in an open plain, underneath a violent gray-green sea of clouds, like the sky just before a tornado. As I watched, Dorothy grew taller and her features sharpened, losing the gentle baby fat of the little girl in the farmhouse. Her dress wrapped around her, the shabby mended gingham transformed to a sleek, tight-plated bodysuit like Glinda's. "'Don't think you can use your connection to take me on a trip down memory lane,' she said coldly. "'I'm coming for you, Amy Gum, and I'm coming for my shoes. I'm going to find a way to make you die.' "'Amy! Amy!' someone was saying my name. I blinked and snapped out of the empty field back into the heat of the battle. Knox was shaking me and calling my name. "'Amy!' he cried frantically. "'What happened? Where did you go?' I tried to use the shoes, I gasped, but they're still connected to Dorothy. She knows where we are now. She's on our way. We have to warn the quadrant, Knox said urgently. I looked up. Glinda and Glamora were still going at it. Glinda's hair had come loose from its bun and surrounded her head in a wild halo. Her armor was rent, rent in dozen places, and her face and hands were smeared with blood, but Glamora wasn't looking much better. Her amethyst form was chipped and cracked in through and though both of them were still flying at each other, she held one arm close to her chest, as though she couldn't move it. I could see flashes of power as Mombi and Gert fought to the ground, but like Knox and me, they were surrounded. The ground was littered with the broken and bloody bodies of Glinda's soldiers, and the air smelled like blood and the electric haze of their spent magic. I could see Melindra and Annabelle or any of the other wicked. I couldn't see Melindra or Annabelle or any of the other wicked. None of us could hold out for much longer. If we didn't do something soon, all of us were going to go down fighting for Oz right here. Suddenly, a terrifying howl split the air. Pete's face went white. I turned to see what he was looking at. Oh no, I said. Beside me, Knox drew his breath in sharply. Dorothy had found us. She wasn't alone. <laughs>